Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing me to come here. Uh, you know, Greg mentioned it's a diverse audience, even let a, an American come, so I appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today um, about becoming digital, right? Every company wants to be digital. Um, I think this is the wrong, yeah. this is the wrong slide deck. Um, it's the other one. It's that one. Yep. Um, every company wants to be digital, but, but what, is, what does that really mean, right? Um, let me give you an example. Uh, so a Swedish automaker, right, Volvo, right, maybe they're not really Swedish anymore, I think they're owned by a Chinese company now, but they make their cars here in Sweden. They announced in October of 2015 that if you get in an accident, an accident in their car while it's in autonomous mode, they're going to cover all liability. What, is, what does that mean for the insurance company? Right? What does that mean for the auto insurance company? If once aut autonomous cars are out there, if automakers are so sure of the ability of their AI that's driving that car for you that you don't need insurance anymore. Right? That's completely digital. And that is completely disrupted. To the industry of the to the insurance industry, so in my mind, every company has a choice today. Every company can be the disruptor or the disrupted. That's it. Those are your two choices today. And so, how do you become digital, and what does it mean for you to become digital? So, becoming digital is a journey. It's not something you can do overnight. Um, it's 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 a process that you have to go through. And it's iterative because you have to change the thinking, the inherent thinking in your company. And for companies that have been born in the last five years, they were born with that change thinking. For companies like IBM that were born 100 years ago, it's really hard to change that thinking, right? And I think many of us are in the situation today where we have to fight our organizations to get them to think about this journey to digital. And becoming digital is really a three-step process. And the first step is how do you become a data-driven organization? So how do you get your organization to start thinking about data when they're making decisions? So stop licking your thumb and saying, I think the wind's blowing this way. This is the decision I'm going to make today. And start using data to make those decisions. And at the beginning of this step, you're going to go talk to people in the business, and they're going to say, Help me get a dashboard that has the data in it that will support my preconceived notions. And that's OK at first, because at least they're looking at the data. right? Is that ideal that they want the data to support their preconceived notions? No. But we're getting there in, them in the right step. And you start thinking about, how do I use data? How has data become an asset? So how do I start valuing data and thinking about data? right? Every one of us have an app, a laptop. Most of them are probably provided by our companies. Most companies make you put an asset tag on that, on that laptop. That's their laptop. When you leave the company, you have to leave it with them. If you steal it, you get in trouble. If you break it, you might get in trouble. If you lose it, your, your security department will probably interrogate you for about 20 minutes. Right? Data is not treated that way in most companies. Data is treated as a digital dropping of applications. Right? It's just something that applications kick off, and, and you guys in the data world figure out what we do with it. And when you start becoming a, a data-driven company, and you get your company to start thinking about using data and treating it as an asset, what does that mean for your, your, what your company reports to, to your board or your investors or, or the street? That really means that those goals that your CEO reports to the street stay the same. What changes is how you start reaching those goals. So you get there a little faster. You get there a little more consistently. right? But you don't really change what you're delivering to the street. You don't change what you're delivering to your customers. Everything stays the same. You just get more efficient at it. And so the next step is becoming a data science-driven organization. And this is where you really start getting away from delivering support for your, your business's preconceived notions. right? This is where you start using machine learning, deep learning, 
operations research to start providing insight into how you can run your, your business differently. This is where you start thinking about, and not, not really executing it, but start thinking about what are new business models that I could use from, based on these machine learning models or AI models. And you start reaching your goals and start differentiating yourself from your competitors, right? So the, street, the goals you report to the street are still the same. Still going to have the same earnings, still going to have the same product portfolio. You're going to get there even faster. You're going to get there even more consistently. And you're going to start separating from the pack. In fact, I think just about every you know, big business school has done a report that companies that use machine learning, not even you know, advanced AI, but machine learning outperform their, their peers, right? And so that's an important step. And this is really where you start going to your business and they stop saying, give me data that supports my preconceived notions. They start saying, give me data and give me analytics that help me understand what I should be doing, right? We start getting to that prediction. What should I be doing, right? We may even start getting to that prescription where we start using things like operations research, right, or decision optimization to start doing scenario planning and simulation based on those machine learning models and not even saying, give me some prescriptions about what should I do, but actually prescribing how do I do things differently? What's my next best action, right? And using math to drive your next best action, even if, even if it's the wrong action, or not the best action, it's repeatable and you can fix it, right? When, when I was in my, my four, I've only been with IBM for 10 months and before I came to IBM, I was at a company where we started doing this data and digital transformation six or seven years ago. And um, you know, people were really fighting leveraging machine learning to drive decisions that they had been doing for years, right? Looking their thumbs and kind of saying this is what it is. And so we, didn't exp we got tired of doing bake-offs, right? Because whenever you could bring machine learning to, to your business, they want to do a bake-off, right? Show me how this compares to the decisions that my people make. And inevitably, there would be some decisions where the computer, the mathematical model, gave a different answer. And the, the humans would say, well, the model was wrong. And I'd say, you know, the model's 97% accurate. There's a 3% chance it's wrong. Well, I don't care. It's different than, than what my people made. And so we did an experiment, and we put the same choice in front of 30 people five times each. And we got some really interesting results. One was that the same person only made the same decision the same way about three out of five times. And the agreement across the 30 people, even when you average out, even when you pick the three out of five, okay, we'll take the one that, the three, as that person's choice, real choice. And when you look across the, the 30 people, there was about a 25% concordance between those people, right? And so then we brought that information back, and we said, even you humans can't agree what the right decision is. How can you say that the model was wrong. And that was a tipping point for us. From that point forward, the leadership, at least, got that, yeah, the models are maybe predicting more consistently, and so we can work with that. Because even the humans aren't making the right decisions, or the best decisions, necessarily. And so that, that's an important step. I'd say avoid bake-offs as best you can. Um, and then, so the final step in this this digital journey is becoming a, a digital enterprise. And if you ask executives what does it mean to be a digital enterprise, some of them will tell you it means we're paperless. That's not what we mean when we say digital enterprise. What it means to be a digital enterprise is that you start using these first two parts of the journey here, and you start fundamentally operating differently as a business. Right? You start thinking about what are business models that I can build off of my data, and off of my analytics. Um, and I would actually argue that most companies can't monetize data directly. It's rare. It's retail, it's weather, uh, it's things like that, right? But most companies can't directly monetize 
data. And most companies, I would argue also, don't want to, because data is what differentiates you from your competitors. Right? The data you have about your business, about your employees, about your customers is what's differentiating you. So I would argue you don't want to mo directly monetize your data. What you, the way you do want to monetize your data is to streamline your processes, right? cut out costs from your processes, make better decisions, and develop new business models. And that last one is really, in my mind, what being digital means. But you got to do that with your eye at the customer. So look at everything in your business from the customer's perspective. Every decision that's being made in any of your leadership teams, the first thing you should ask if you're a digital company is, what impact does this have on the customer? How is this going to make the customer's life easier? Right? And then you start thinking about, well, if I'm going to make the customer's life easier, is it easy for them to buy a product? Do they want to buy a product? Or do they want to buy a solution to something? Do they want to buy an outcome? Greg talked about GE, right? When GE, when GE Salesforce goes out, they don't show up at Boeing, and they don't show up at British Airways or SAS and say, you want to buy a jet engine? If they want to buy a jet engine, they'll call them, right? What they show up and say is, we want to sell you uptime on your jet engine. That's an outcome. It's not a product. There's no physical product involved in their mind. It's purely an outcome. Right? And so think about, from your customer's perspective, what are the outcomes that my customers are interested in buying? And when your company starts thinking like that, that's when you're digital. That's when you're digital, not until then. And that's a really hard journey, because when you start thinking about becoming digital and selling outcomes, it may be that the best choice for your customer and the best way to make your outcome successful is to sell com some components of your platforms that are actually from your competitors. Think about that. To, se to truly sell an outcome, in some cases, you need to sell your competitors' products, maybe, because they have a better product in that area. But you don't care about that because you want to make your customer successful. Right? That's game changing. Most companies can't get their heads around that. Most people in the C suite, no way, you're crazy. But that's how you have to think. And when your people in your company come to you and say, Why are you selling our competitors' products? You say, Well, our competitors' products. You want me to sell our product? Make that one better. Right? So think about that. And so at this point, this is really where you start talking differently to the street. And this is really where your CEO shows up and says, we are no longer a company from X sector. We are now a digital company. We sell, no longer sell jet engines, we sell uptime, right? I come from, a, from an agricultural background where I worked for the last 10 years. We declared, our CEO declared, we're not a seed and trades company anymore. We are now a digital ag company, right? That was completely game-changing, and the street looked at us differently and started treating us differently. And so, you know, to, to do this, I think, I really, really feel strongly, and, and, and it's not just because I have this title, but I really feel it's, it's, it's important, and even if you don't have a designated CEO, or CDO, I mean, it's really important that you have someone in your company that owns data. Because remember, in this first step, you start tr thinking of data as an asset. And part of thinking as data as an asset is, you know, every organization has someone in, in, you know, has silos, right? And someone in each of those silos thinks they own the data for that silo. And so you need to take that ownership away from them, because it's not their data. It's the company's data. It's the company's asset. It's not Seth's asset. It's IBM's asset, right? And so you need a CDO or someone that's serving in that role. And from going around and talking to, you know, I spent the last 10 months literally flying around the world a couple times, talking to CDOs and talking to companies. And, you know, over the last seven years before I came to IBM, I spent a lot of time talking to, to CDOs as well. There's really five things, five things that CDOs care about and CDO types care about. Um, 
And depending on what industry you are, these are going to have a different priority, right? And, and I, always, I always say that people can only really focus on three things. And so if you're responsible for this in your mind, pick the, pick the top three that are most important. And they'll change, you know, in a year they'll change, hopefully. And so, you know, the, mo the first one, and I think this is the most important, is how do you develop enterprise data assets, right? How do you, and this is just conceptually, what are the assets that your company truly cares about? And for every company, I think there's three, three assets that every company has, right, at, at a bare minimum. And it should be no more than six, because you really, again, you got to get your company to rally around these. One is your customer. Every company should care about their customer, right? Because remember I said to be a digital company, everything's got to be through the eyes of your customer. So you should have a data asset around your customer. And I'll, I'll get into these a little bit more. Every company should care about their products, right? Every company has some form of product, right? And every company should care about their talent. And these are the core data assets that every company should have. Now, you may care about geospatial. You may be a manufacturing company. You may care about all the data coming off your machines or your connected devices, right? But those are, those are going to change depending on, on the company you are. The next thing is you need to, uh, to get a unified governance strategy. You know, and, I, and I think um, Greg mentioned that you know, every company is going to be digital soon or be in a cloud soon and have multiple environments. And I, you know, my experience is that companies are not going to go to a single cloud. Companies are going to be on multiple clouds. I'd say minimum of four or five, especially if you consider Salesforce and Workday and things like that as cloud. In fact, if you consider Salesforce a cloud, most companies are, are in the cloud today. They just don't acknowledge it, right, necessarily. And so you need a way to govern that data across your legacy environment, across your cloud environments. You need to not care, it shouldn't have to care if it's structured or unstructured or where it sits. You should be able to govern it, period. And then you need to build deployable data science assets. So as you start developing machine learning models, um, if you del deliver these machine learning models, as a CSV file, it's worthless. So what is your strategy as a CDO to deliver these machine learning models as REST endpoints into your applications and into your processes? They have to be consumed directly by your applications and your processes. Otherwise, they're useless. So how are you going to do that? And again, you need an integrated cloud strategy, because I mentioned before that every company is going to have multiple clouds. And then you need a sustainable talent pipeline because the talent that you need to do this is very different and everyone wants them. So how do you keep them engaged? How do you build from the talent base you have, these skills you need today, and how do you attract new talent? That's critical. So let's, let's get into this. And so how do you, you know, what, what, how do you, you kind of go through this process? How do you develop your data as an asset, and that's really what I'm going to focus on for, for the rest of my time is, how do you develop data as an asset? And so the first step is to define your core data assets. And I have, I have four of them up here, right? So I have customer. This is getting that, you know, that trendy customer 360 view, and I told, stole the 360 just because it was trendy, and I applied it to all these other things. So how do you get a single view of their customer? Most companies do not have a single version of their customer. Most companies have anywhere from five to 600 views of their customer, especially if they're multinational. Because each region, each country has their own view, multiple own views of customers as well. So how do you get that single view of your customer so that you truly understand them? And with GDPR looming, this is critical, right? Because as a subject, I can call up, I can ping IBM and say, tell me all the data you have about me. And it's not just the data in the US, it's not just the data in the UK, it's the data everywhere in that company, right? And most people, and I do this too, most people talk about you know, the dangers of not being GDPR compliant, right? I think it's important to understand the danger, up to 4% total global revenue per instance, right? Quickly put a company out of business. You talk about that to your board to get it funded, right? Because they're going to care about that. The upside of GDPR is it will fundamentally change your relationship with your customer. 
right? This whole consent management, explicit consent, fundamentally changes your relationship with your customer. It gives you direct access as data people, as people that care about data and analytics, to ask your customers, can I predict for you, can I help you understand what are choices that you would make? And it helps you build that relationship with them so that something that if you didn't explicitly ask them, they might think was creepy, to essentially they've asked for it. By clicking that box and saying, I consent to you doing this to me, they've now asked for it, so it's no longer creepy. Right? I mean, everyone's heard that Target story where some young woman went to Target, started shopping, you know, she was a teenager, and her parents got an email or, or some flyers in the mail saying she was pregnant. And you know what? She was. That was creepy. <laughs> that was totally creepy, right? But so now you opt into these things and they're more explicit. They're no longer creepy. And so that, that's a, the, I'm gonna, off my, uh, my positive aspect of GDPR soapbox now. But I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, you know, again, you need to, to build, optimize your talent pool and you build a talent 360. And then everything else I kind of sweep into this company bucket, right? Because there's other things you care about. You have to maintain them as assets, right? Things like, you know, legal and, um, you know, stuff like that. Financial should probably go in product because that's where you, you make your money, right? But there's other things that you care about that you need to, to do. And you don't actually do any physical work at this time. You don't re-architect your data. You just conceptually define what your data assets are, right? Very high level, very, you know, not really getting into the weeds or even worrying about where the data sits or how I'm going to get to it. Just the goal is to map out what it is conceptually so that you can bring it together. And then the next step, um, and this is where you start changing culture in your organization. And you go sit down with your business partners and you start talking about the decisions that they make, right? And again, the first thing they're going to say is, give me a dashboard. Well, that's not a decision, right? What decision are you trying to make with that dashboard? What decision are you trying to drive? And you kind of bucket these decisions in classes, right? And, and I typically kind of align these classes to the different functions within the business, right? And then you start thinking about categories of decisions. So when your, your uh, marketing person says, I want to understand customer churn, right? So what are the models? What are the, the types of decisions that I make around churn? You know, if you're a financial institution or, or any other, you know, insurance, how do I avoid fraud? How do I detect fraud before it happens? Right? And then for each of these, most of these things for most companies are not going to be a single model. Right? To, de to, de to figure out your, cus your customer churn is probably going to be dozens of models. Right? It's not a single model that's going to deliver most things for you. If it is, you're not asking a hard enough question. Okay? And then, how are you going to deliver these models back to your business? So you go back to them and you say, okay, now I'm going to give you a dashboard. But this dashboard is going to give you predictions on what you should do, right? Or you're going to go back and deliver these predictions into a process or into an application. So I'm not arguing that every decision should just be made by a computer, right? There are some, there are many that should be fully automated. But there are some where you should put choices in front of a person. And say, here's the likelihood that this is the right decision. For example, if I show up at my doctor's office, do I want, and I, let's, God forbid, but let's say I have cancer, do I want that decision driven completely by a computer? No. But do I want that decision driven completely by a human? No way. Because that doctor can't keep up with all the latest research, right? That doctor can't understand my genetics and what drugs are going to be most effective on a given cancer based on my genetics and the genetics of that cancer. There's no way a single human can keep up with that. A computer can do that very quickly, right, and really understand that. And so it's important that we still keep humans in the loop on this, on things like that. And so the next step is really you know, going through these decisions and, and mapping out, is the data available? 
Are, is the customer, is the business unit going to use it? Is the data of good quality? Do I have all the data I need? And you kind of build this priority matrix, right? This is the likelihood of success, and this is the likelihood of, or the value, or the likelihood of implementation. And you can also use the size of the circle to, you want to assess a value for that decision. So you want to assign a value to that decision, right? And you create a decision score, and then you prioritize them. And of course, like anything else, you start with the ones up here, right? Because those are the easiest, to, likely, most likely to succeed, easiest to implement, and maybe even have a high value. But the first couple, you really shouldn't focus on value, just focus on making people successful, OK? And then you map these decisions back to your data. And this gets back to the point made at the beginning around how do you start valuing, putting a number on the value of that data asset. So you've assigned a value to your decisions. You know which of these data assets went into making that decision. And you even kind of have a, you can even derive how much of that decision was driven by a given piece of data. So if you value a data, a, piece of, a, a decision at $10 billion to your company, and you know 60% of it came from customer, well, check. Customer now has $6 billion worth of value. Right? And you assess that value in whatever language your CFO is used to talking about. Okay, and so now you've valued your data. And it start, people start thinking about it as an asset. Now, to the point about data not being part of traditional accounting, I think at this point, you can start thinking about it. I don't know of any company that has actually done this yet. Um, but I do know that uh, someone from Gartner is releasing a paper either this week or next week on how do you, how do, you do that. Uh, and an analyst from Red Monk released a paper a few weeks ago on the same thing. How do you make data an asset physically on your books? But I don't think anyone's done this yet. And then get back to the unified governance piece, because this is really important, governing across all of your environments. And now, I would, I would encourage you all, you know, I talk about how you run your businesses differently. IT companies like IBM need to run their companies differently too, right? Just like I'm saying, there should be machine learning in everything you do, and AI in everything you do. When you think about buying platforms to run your business, those platforms better have AI in them too. Your governance platform better use AI. Your databases better use AI. The platforms you use for building AI better use AI. That's table stakes now. Shouldn't even talk to people if they don't do that. Because they're going to be left behind. They're going to be dis disrupted. All right, and so with that, thank you. I think I'm close to being on time. <laughs>